Amen. Well, if you will turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, the ninth chapter, we'll, uh, we'll get into a familiar verse of Scripture here, and uh, we'll read a couple of verses. Uh, how many of you were not here this morning? Can I see your hands? Okay, don't be embarrassed. Just appreciate you being here tonight. How many of you were? Can I see your hand? If you were here this morning, okay, most of us were. This morning I talked about covenant. I have a, um, a CD-ROM series, uh, I think it's out there, it's called The Covenant and the Kingdom, and it is an entire curriculum of about, I think, 120 lessons, um, and <clears throat> what I, what I want to try to get through to you in a simple form is this, God's covenant is the foundation of everything he does. God is a covenant-making, keeping God. His word is not yes or no, but yea and amen. And his word is him. He is in his word. He doesn't just give you his word. He comes with the word. Now, the second thing I want you to understand is the kingdom of God, and we'll say this again, is the administration of his word. He administrates his covenant. His covenant's what he said he would do. When he told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and I'm going to give you lands, he administrated that word. He watched over his word to what? Perform it. And that's the kingdom. The kingdom is God's government of what he said he would do. Right? Let me just understand. I want you to understand this. God's not making it up as you pray. I believe in prayer. But I believe in praying according to the will of God. Why? Because God is going to perform his will. Now, I don't understand how our will and his interact and work together, and I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that God hears our prayers. I believe our prayers can be effective, but within his will. Because God's not going to deviate his eternal purpose because you've got an idea. I want us to be sure. So the kingdom is the government of what he promised. Are you with me now so far? All right. The church is the gathering of kingdom citizens. The covenant is the constitution. The kingdom is the administration. The church is the gathering of kingdom citizens. Are you there? That's not real complicated, is it? Okay. Now, uh, we'll talk about the kingdom tonight and uh, the church, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. Now, the series that the pastor asked me to do is the foundations for the future. We don't know, we don't know the future. We, we know some things about the future, but we don't know the future. We had, uh, <clears throat> we had Nick Ripkin at our leadership conference uh, a few weeks back. And Nick has interviewed persecuted Christians in 72 countries. Uh, he, he was burned out. He, 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 was a, he was making disciples in Mogadishu. You, you know where Mogadishu is? Somalia, the worst place in the world. Three of his disciples were killed, martyred. Now, this guy has told us about, per how many of you understand that per Christians are being persecuted in many, many parts of the world? I was just reading the scripture that says that we are to we are to identify with the with the prison, those in prison for the gospel because we're part of their body. Here's another interesting fact: the church is growing more where it's being persecuted than where it's comfortable. Are you there? Why is that? Because they find out how important their faith is, and. Um, what the kingdom means. Now, covenant is what God said. Kingdom is what God does to administrate it. What's more? Oh, I, don't, I shouldn't say that. For years, my message was about the church. And then one day, I understood the message is about the kingdom. It's not about the church. Jesus doesn't say much about the church at all. He says something twice. And Paul writes to the churches, the apostles write to the churches, but the message is about the kingdom. How I many of you know we hear a lot more about the church than we do the kingdom? 
But see, you know why the church is in the mess it's in? Because people, a lot of them haven't entered the kingdom. They don't know what the kingdom is. And so they see the church as a meeting. The kingdom is something else. The covenant is God's word. The kingdom is when you're born again by the word of God and by the Holy Spirit into God's government. We're not born into the church. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to argue with you, not arguing with me. I'm just, I'm just uptight. <laughs> but as a pastor, I used to, I used to equate joining the church with joining the kingdom. And we baptize people into the church. Well, that's okay. But that's not really what the scripture's talking about. We're baptized into the kingdom. We're born into the kingdom. John 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, uh, unless you're born again from above, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now, he had religion, but he couldn't see the kingdom. He didn't even see the king. And then he said, again, unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom. So what, what is it we're trying to enter here, the church? Well, a lot of people have entered the church. They've never entered the kingdom. That's why the church is in a mess. That's why people pretty much do what they feel like doing instead of what God told them to do. So, the kingdom. You know, you don't really see the kingdom sometimes till you're in a mess. Um, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and I'm going to get to my message here in a minute. I'm just, I have a short message, but long introductions. Okay. He taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's, they said, teach us to pray. That's what he told them. Now, I'm afraid a lot of people pray what we call the Lord's Prayer and think that the kingdom is something way off up out yonder. I, uh, this message came out of an experience that I had. Um. I, I, uh, I was traveling too much. I was working too hard. I preached 25 times between Sunday and Thursday, and nobody knows that much. I, was, uh, I gave all I had and some things I didn't have. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but the pastor, I felt, used me and uh, I was just tired, burned out. And, and I had preached about six or 800 times that year. Um, just because you're asked doesn't mean you have to go. Um, and so I, I was so tired and so burned out, I asked two friends to join me in a hotel to pray. Spent three days seeking the Lord. That's what you do when you don't know what else to do. And so... Uh, you ever, you, ever, you ever been so burned out you couldn't pray? I mean, you could pray in your heart, but you didn't know what to say. And so uh, my mother, my mother was raised Catholic. She was a South Louisiana Catholic. And um, growing up Catholic, you say the Lord's Prayer a lot. And uh, my father was a missionary in the Bayes of South Louisiana, and my mother met the Lord, and, and uh, I grew up with a mother that was a German Cajun. That's a bad cocktail. <laughs> and she was a wonderful lady. She had a great heart, but she would look you in the eye and fire would shoot out. Anyway, <laughs> she told me one time, she said, Son, you be careful about that Lord's Prayer. She said, because there's stuff in there, you better think about what you're saying. And one of those things is, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. That means if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. So when I got to that part of the prayer, I'd just mumble. Anyway, <laughs> I wouldn't pray it. It's true. Not that I didn't want to forgive, but just in case. 
<laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, when you burn out, you can only memorize, say memorize prayers. I, I got down, a, a friend of mine played a, a, a cassette with a guy reading the Psalms and beautiful music in the background. He had a wonderful voice, and he was just reading the Psalms. It was like, it was like a bomb to my soul. And when the tape ran, ran out, I got down on my knees and started praying the Lord's Prayer. And I, the words, you know, when you're like that, the words just tear out of your heart, it's, I mean, out of your stomach. It's just not easy to talk. And I said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And, and I'm thinking about everything I'm saying. And then I said, thy kingdom come. I felt like I just got crushed. For the first time in my life, I realized that the kingdom wasn't a future thing. It was a present reality. Now, I believe there will be a, a manifest kingdom on the earth. But my problem was I was a charismatic out of control. I was living outside the kingdom. The, the image I had was of a, a boy who grew up with a wealthy father, and the father gave him a brand-new uh, sports car and a credit card and didn't see him again. I felt like my father had blessed me, and I had left the kingdom in a sense because the Bible says in the next line, thy will be done on earth. Say it with me. Thy will be done on earth on earth that went around in my mind like a broken record i never finished the lord's prayer i fell in the floor and a, and a puddle of weeping my friends did it was like they heard the same thing i did thy kingdom come I, I couldn't talk about anything but the kingdom for the next six months it was just you know bob mumford said one time when a person gets baptized in the spirit spirit they ought to be locked up for six months well i think there's some truth to that because you can't talk about it. People think, well, what happened to you? <laughs> you can just talk about one thing. Well, that's the way I was about the kingdom. Everywhere I went, I wanted to talk about the kingdom. Now, this is the message of Jesus. Go with me, if you have your Bible, go with me to uh, Matthew 4, okay? All right. There's no way I'm going to finish this message. I, I, I didn't read, I, I didn't read uh, Isaiah, did I? All right, go to Matthew 4, and I'll read Isaiah to you, all right? Isaiah 6, for unto us a child is born. How many of you know that verse? Unto us a son is given, and the government, say government with me. Government, government will be on his shoulder. He should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government, you could put kingdom there, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with justice, judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. And don't forget the last line. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will, how many of you understand, we're not going to build the kingdom. Who's going to build the kingdom? The Lord. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. Our job is to testify to the king. His job is to build the kingdom. Are you there? He will in his time. Now, I'm a great believer in the sovereignty of God. Now, Matthew 4, let's go there. Uh, Jesus has been tempted of the devil. And one of the things the devil uh, tempted him about was the kingdoms of the world. He said, if you will bow down, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, Jesus, of course, refused that because he had a better kingdom. Verse 17, Matthew 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, what? Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. And then he goes about and starts uh, calling his disciples. Now, we, we, could, we could spend a lot of time. Go to 633. Would you do that? You know this verse too. But let's go. 
Matthew 6, 33. Well, let's go to 31 and go through 33, all right? I'm reading from the New King James Version. Verse 31, therefore, do not worry. How many of you are sinners when it comes to worry? Anybody here? The rest of you are too weak to raise your hand. I'm telling you, worry is a big problem, all right? Don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear for all these things the Gentiles seek? We're, we're Gentiles. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. They're not wrong. We need them. But he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Let's say it together. Seek first. Let's say it with gusto. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, these things he talked about. Now, uh, I heard Bob say again, Bob Mumford, I'm quoting him tonight, I don't often, but sister brought up his name. He talked about the Sermon on the Mount being the constitution of the kingdom, and that is true. I would encourage you to study uh, Matthew 5, excuse me, 6 and 7, because those three chapters tell you how Jesus reigns, what Jesus expects of us, what he wants us to do. Now, <clears throat> there's so much said about the kingdom in the New Testament. Um, it's a message of Jesus. How many of you understand if it's a message of Jesus and we believe in Jesus, it ought to be our message? Are you there? Do you know, when, when I saw the kingdom, I just told you a story about it a while ago in 1974, and I know exactly where I was, and I began to preach the kingdom. Do you know that a lot of Christians called me a Jehovah's Witness? Now, you might say, well, why was that? Because the Jehovah's Witness always talking about the kingdom. I was in one of the largest churches in the country in a pastor's meeting, several hundred pastors there, and there was a debate going on because at that time, most of Charismatics and Pentecostals and Evangelicals believed the kingdom was a future event. I grew up that way. I could diagram the book of Revelation, Daniel, and almost Ezekiel, not quite. Hmm. But, but I would, if you'd have said the kingdom is now, now I don't mean by that that it's all now because I don't believe we can inherit fully until we're transformed. But the kingdom is in us and shall be manifested through us. I believe that Jesus is king right now. How many of you believe that's true? Yes. All right. Now, Romans 14, 17, my friend Ern Baxter used to quote all the time, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and what? Joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, Brother Baxter used to say, that the righteousness, peace, and the joy are all in the Holy Spirit. In other words, the kingdom is in the Spirit. Okay? How I many of you understand that everything we have from God is in the Holy Spirit? That's why I love the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I pray that God, won't, that, that God will have our full attention. The enemy hates the Holy Spirit. And when people begin to move in the Spirit, they will encounter persecution like nothing else because the enemy is afraid of the Holy Spirit. Why? Um, because the government of God is in the Holy Spirit. God governs in the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm trying to say this right, and I appreciate that you're listening. Churches rarely get in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gets present. I believe God is with us, but it's different than getting in the Spirit. John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, 
and he begins to describe the vision. All the prophets talked about getting in the Spirit or being carried away by the Spirit. How many of you understand that the whole dimension that we talk about is a spiritual dimension? It's not natural. Uh, that's why the enemy hates the Spirit so much. He doesn't want you to get in the Spirit. He doesn't want your mind focused on the Spirit. He doesn't want you consumed by the presence of the Holy Spirit because you're going to go somewhere, you're going to see something that will change your life forever that you'll take with you to heaven. And so what happens is we develop a routine, we get on autopilot, we want the Holy Spirit to be present, we just don't want it to change anything. And when you get in the Spirit, you begin to see the kingdom, the government of God. Everything God does in this world, he does by the Holy Spirit. If we could just turn some of the arguments about the Spirit into obeying the Spirit, this would be a different world. Now, you can't define the kingdom of God. I have described it. I haven't defined it. I have said the Constitution is the covenant of God, what he says. The kingdom is the administration of his word. I have said that. But let me just say this. God's authority and power go far beyond anything we can describe. My dad told me one time something I'll never forget. He said, just remember, when you're talking about the things of God, you can describe them but you can't define them. Why? Because we're dealing with a mind we can't define. Do you ever, when you're praying, do you ever stop and ask yourself, what kind of a mind am I talking to? Number one, how can I be talking to him and everybody else be talking to him at the same time and he's listening? And if he conceived stars out there that make our sun look like a grapefruit, what kind of a mind am I dealing with? It, I mean, you know, he made all that's been made. Well, there are galaxies out there that have a, 100 million stars. There's 150 billion galaxies. Are you there? Have I, have I, have I snowed you out here? So you say, well, I know all about the kingdom. <laughs> we only know what God shows us. If he doesn't show you, you don't know it because we're dealing with a whole different realm. So Jesus made a big deal out of the kingdom. The apostles made a big deal out of the kingdom. We can describe it. We know it's necessary to be born again if we're going to see it and enter into it. We know that much. Let me add something to that. Jesus is the seed of the kingdom. If you, if, if, you plant a, if you plant an apple seed, what are you going to get? In, in John 12, he said, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings much fruit. And he was talking about his death. He said, "This the hour has come when I have to be glorified. So he's the seed of the kingdom. He's the king. Again, my friend Brother Baxter used to say, the kingdom is in the king. Everything's in the king. And so if he's the grain of wheat that fell on the ground and die, what does he expect to reap? His life. Not only in character and morals, but in action. He said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God has come nigh to you. He didn't say, if, if I don't believe in devils. He said, if I cast out devils, the king, it's an action thing. So Jesus is the seed of, if Christ is in us and grows up, then we should somehow be doing what he does. This, you know, another lie is that it's about what you believe and not what you do. 
In other words, Christianity is more than a creed. Anybody can say a creed. And if you're smart, you believe it. But that doesn't mean you do it. It's if Christ is not in us sitting there saying, I believe that. Christ is in there saying, let's do that. Let's go for it. So the kingdom is not in word or deed, but in power. That's in 1 Corinthians somewhere. <laughs> I take some comfort because in, in Hebrews it says somewhere it is written. <laughs> anyway, uh, the kingdom is not in word only, but in power. The kingdom is in power. The kingdom's more than a creed. The kingdom is God honoring his word, working through us. Now, again, that's not a definition. And so we're kingdom seed. And seed have to die. Now, I don't necessarily mean to be martyred, but a lot of people are. But we do have to die to ourselves. The kingdom operates in our death and his life. It operates in our dying to ourselves, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die. I have found that that's on the installment plan. <laughs> I think it'd be easier, Pastor, just to be killed than to die on the installment plan. Um. The Lord spoke to me one time, I felt, and he said, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to help you get rid of your reactor because I'm a reactionary person. And uh, he said, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to wear it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of how we die. He wears us out. All right. The revelation of the kingdom is by the Spirit, and it's progressive. Revelation is progressive. Say it with me. Revelation is progressive. Now, I'll, I'll just cite Mark 4. I won't turn. Verse 21, I think, through 25. He said, you don't, you don't light a candle and put it under a bed or under a bushel. Um, I think um, some churches ought to be called first light under the bushel church or something because we keep it contained. He said, he goes on to say, but he that hears will hear more. He that doesn't hear will lose what he thought he heard. Are you listening? I may be like to hear more. I may be understand that hearing is all important. I may be understand that that's why the devil tries to keep you from hearing. I got a lot of whippings on Monday morning because I cut up in church. And, you know, a lot of modern therapists would say that was cruel. I think it was very wise because it taught me to listen. Because if you never learn to listen, you don't hear. If you don't hear, you don't hear more. You just stay stupid all your life. But if you listen, I mean really listen, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. The church has said over and over. Jesus said over and over, he that's got ears to hear, hear. Why? Because if you hear, a light comes on and you hear more. I mean, if you'd like to hear more, would you like to hear more? I would. I'd like to hear more. Well, it's a progressive thing. You can think, well, okay, I got that. You ever read a scripture and realize you never read it before? He that hears, hears more. The revelation of the kingdom, the revelation of the government of God is progressive. If you hear and you're a steward of what you hear, He's going to show you more until you mature. And you have to hear to mature. You have to, you have to understand to mature. If it's, 
you know, you, it's one thing to grow up. It's another thing to mature. And so he says, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Oh, we could go the rest of the night on that, and I'm not going to do it. Don't be scared. That's a tremendous parable. Why? Because first the grain of corn, and then comes the stalk, and then comes an ear, and then inside that ear there's corn farming. Do you know that that is the whole plan of history? That what God planted, he's going to reap. You're not going to have a New Testament church and reap some weird thing that's based on cookies and ice cream. What are you going to reap? What's the answer to that question? What are you going to reap? What is that going to look like? First, the, the grain of wheat falls on the ground, then the blade the stalk, and then the blade, and then the, the ear of corn, and what's going on inside that corn? It looks just like what was planted. Help me, Father. I don't think the church looks like what was planted yet. I don't. I, I, my, God bless it. I love this church. I love the one at home. I, love, I go to churches all the time. I love them. It's wonderful. But if there's life there, it's starting to look like what was planted. There's going to be some miracles sometimes. There's going to be some persecution sometimes. You know what? I think we're headed there. Honestly, I think there are people in this nation right now that are doing everything in their power to quieten Christianity, shove it in a corner, and make some things illegal. And if you don't agree with what the secular culture says, you'll lose your tax-exempt status. Are you listening to me? And then, you know, if you stand for it publicly, you might get examined by the IRS. And they may find that you didn't really pay everything you should have paid. And you might find yourself in trouble with the government. Oh, that's not far. That's not far at all. That's not hard to imagine. The IRS has already revealed that they will persecute people that don't agree with them politically. I went through a five-year IRS investigation. cost our church $100,000. I'm not talking to you about theories. I, and I don't, I don't want you to hate the government. I don't, I don't want you to hate the IRS. The Bible says we're to honor the government. I'm just trying to say to you that we need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church because he wants to bring the church back to the place where it looks like what was sown. Um, and I think it will. It's already there in a lot of places. We have friends in Africa, Middle East, China. I just talked to a man, got back from China. Um, we need to get beyond our understanding of the church. But we can't do that till we begin to understand the kingdom. If God governs us, not in the meeting, when we leave the meeting, if he governs you, if the Holy Spirit says, do this, and you don't even understand why, he just said, do it. Should we be able to do it? If he says stop and talk to that person, if he says pray for that person, if he says anything, what would happen if the church got loose in the kingdom under the government of the Holy Spirit? Um, most churches are worried about church growth. I'm not worried about church growth. What I'm concerned about is what the church does when it leaves the church. The measure is not how many we get in the meeting. The measure is how many in the meeting we get out into the world. And um, pastor asked me, 
asked me to speak to the ministers Tuesday, right? Um, what would I say if this was my last sermon? That always makes me nervous at my age when somebody says, do that. But you know immediately what I thought? I would say exactly what Jesus said in his last message. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize, teach. That's what, that's what we need to be hearing. That's the kingdom. That's his government in our lives. Well, it's progressive. If we hear, we'll hear more. If we obey, we'll see more. He is Lord. He's king. I mean, if you understand, you don't vote on kings. You don't decide if you're going to do what the king wants you to do. If he's the king. <clears throat> By the way, he's not our chairman. He's not our president. He's our king. He's a good king. He's benevolent. He's merciful. But he's serious. He is the king of the kingdom, and his word is the foundation. And in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, Jesus said, Listen to what I'm saying to you because the man who listens is like a man that built his house on the rock. The winds came, the storm, it stood. Those that didn't listen, he said, they're like somebody that built their house on sand. The wind came and blew it away. That wasn't just a parable. Israel was destroyed. He was trying to say to them, listen to what I'm saying, and it'll save you. I live where hurricanes come. I live where floods happen. <clears throat> and you know it's important where you build your house, what you build it on, what kind of foundation. The kingdom of God is unshakable. I, uh, I'm not going to read, you know, Hebrews 12. He says that this is an unshakable kingdom. David said that um, it's like Mount Zion. Those that build on Christ are like Mount Zion, unshakable. Kingdom is unshakable. Then he says this I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken so that only what cannot be shaken will remain. Most of us have things in our lives that can be shaken, but you don't know it until the shaking comes. And then they start rattling. And that's the time to get rid of that. And what doesn't shake? The Word of God, the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, seek first the kingdom of God. Pray this prayer. Lord, there's more to the kingdom than I know, but I want you to govern me. I want your government in my life by the Holy Spirit. Help me to hear the Holy Spirit and do what he tells me to do and be ready to watch what happens. Be ready.